You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 20, Sonnet 19. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not, not just another not one in your place? place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions and as importantly for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support the graphic novel adaptation at www.patreon.com slash Fisher King. Every dollar helps breed a page that brings us closer to a beautiful graphic novel that will make the sonnets so much more accessible. And of course, 10 times that dollar will bring you the finished product 10 times faster. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 19. Sonnet 19 is a plea from Shakespeare and his sonnet reflection to Father Time, who is both Kronos and the Grim Reaper. Devouring time, blunt thou the lion's paws, and make the earth devour her own sweet brood. Pluck the keen teeth from the fierce tiger's jaws, and burn the long-lived phoenix in her blood. In the modernized text, time has been capitalized and devouring highlighted as an adjective or epithet. Time was not capitalized in the 1609 quarto text, however, nor was there a comma, and so we can read this both as addressing Father Time, who sees the aging and passing of even the most powerful and long-lived creations, but also as a suggestion that Shakespeare's sonnets are devouring time, protecting his spirit from the beasts, the earthly grave, and outliving even the phoenix. The lion is likely a reference to the constellation Leo, mentioned by Phoebus as one of the obstacles that his son Phaethon would have to contend with. Or it may possibly be a biblical reference to the first Peter, chapter 5, which speaks of the devil as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Over time, whatever the earth produces will return to the soil, and while this might be an oblique reference to Kronos devouring his children, I believe it's simply a continuation of the theme of tombs and graves. Although we're familiar with the story of the phoenix being reborn in fire, in Book 15 of Ovid's Metamorphosis it is described as dying and being reborn in a nest full of spices. I'm not sure whether this is of any relevance, but regardless of what Arthur Golding translated, the fire version that we're familiar with today was well known back then. I find it interesting that the lion, the tiger, and the phoenix are each only mentioned once in the sequence, here, especially seeing as the phoenix is such an important symbol referenced from Shakespeare's poem, The Phoenix and the Turtle. Make glad and sorry seasons as thou fleetest, and do what ear thou wilt, swift-footed time, to the wide world and all her fading sweets, but I forbid thee one most heinous crime. While the meaning of this quatrain is straightforward, there are a few words I'd like to mention that add some flavor. Fleet, as an adjective, meant swift, but as a verb, meant to fade or vanish, and would probably have been recognized as a reference to ships. More interestingly, Fleet Street in London was known for printing and publishing, and so this simple word, fleetest, appears to be combining all of these notions which connect to the established themes of ink and printing and sailing and vanishing over the horizon. Where the modernized text says, what air, the original text is, what ear. Of course this can be read as whatever to say that time can do whatever it wishes, but the original text allows for a reading of the word ear as before. In this case, the reader can get the sense of, do what you want, time, before you fade and vanish. Although we still have the sense of whatever, this reading suggests the idea that time is finite, leading inexorably on towards Judgment Day. Sweets would have meant both pleasing things and beloved ones. O oh, carve not with thy hours my love's fair brow, nor draw no lines there with thine antique pen. Him in thy course untainted do allow, for beauty's pattern to succeeding men. This quatrain is interesting as it positions time as the writer and our world as the poetry, almost like the story of the Matrix for the turn of the 17th century. 
That is the precise nature of reality from the perspective of Shakespeare's spirit embedded in the sonnet. This quatrain is ambiguous and serves as a plea to time both to release Shakespeare's love, his spirit buried in the sonnet, from time's effects, but also as a plea to preserve Shakespeare himself, in both cases by allowing the text to survive unmolested. It is sadly ironic, then, that with John Benson's 1640 republication of the sonnets that's precisely the hateful crime that time committed. For almost 400 years, Shakespeare's true nature has been tainted, the meaning behind his sonnets perverted into little more than a sexually suggestive but highly artful series of missives to fictitious lovers. I find it tragically fascinating that through his sonnets, Shakespeare's words seem to anticipate so much of how his verse has been treated. Yet do thy worst, old time, despite thy wrong, my love shall in my verse ever live young. Here, the sonnet turns from concern to confidence, and, as history would have it, rightly so. The value in Shakespeare's sonnets is not in how we read them, but that we read them at all, and Shakespeare had faith that we would not only continue to read them, but that some day we would look back through the centuries and see him again, young and full of love, sorrow, beauty, and wisdom, and that we would agree to open our mouths and lend him our voices. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a book, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support this project at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Keep up with the graphic novel at sonnetcomics.com and join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnetcomics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What if I say I'm not just another one in your place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender?